What is genital herpes? Genital herpes is a sexually transmitted disease STD, caused by the herpes simplex virus type 1 HSV1, or type 2 HSV2. How common is genital herpes? Genital herpes infection is common in the United States. CDC estimates that, annually, 776,000 people in the United States get new genital herpes infections. Nationwide, 11.9% of persons aged 14 to 49 years have HSV2 infection, 12.1% when adjusted for age. However, the prevalence of genital herpes infection is higher than that because an increasing number of genital herpes infections are caused by HSV1. Oral HSV1 infection is typically acquired in childhood, because the prevalence of oral HSV1 infection has declined in recent decades, people may have become more susceptible to contracting a genital herpes infection from HSV1. HSV2 infection is more common among women than among men. The percentages of those infected during 2015-2016 were 15.9% versus 8.2% respectively, among 14 to 49 year olds. This is possibly because genital infection is more easily transmitted from men to women than from women to men during penile vaginal sex. HSV2 infection is more common among non-Hispanic blacks 34.6% than among non-Hispanic whites 8.1%. A previous analysis found that these disparities exist even among persons with similar numbers of lifetime sexual partners. Most infected persons may be unaware of their infection. In the United States, an estimated 87.4% of 14 to 49 year olds infected with HSV2 have never received a clinical diagnosis. The age adjusted percentage of persons in the United States infected with HSV2 decreased from 18.0% in 1999 2000 to 12.1% in 2015 2016. How do people get genital herpes? Infections are transmitted through contact with HSV in herpes lesions, mucosal surfaces, genital secretions, or oral secretions. HSV1 and HSV2 can be shed from normal appearing oral or genital mucosa or skin. Generally, a person can only get HSV2 infection during genital contact with someone who has a genital HSV2 infection. However, receiving oral sex from a person with an oral HSV-1 infection can result in getting a genital HSV-1 infection. Transmission commonly occurs from contact with an infected partner who does not have visible lesions and who may not know that he or she is infected. In persons with asymptomatic HSV-2 infections, genital HSV shedding occurs on 10.2% of days, compared to 20.1% of days among those with symptomatic infections. What are the symptoms of genital herpes? Most individuals infected with HSV are asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms that go unnoticed or are mistaken for another skin condition. When symptoms do occur, herpes lesions typically appear as one or more vesicles, or small blisters, on or around the genitals, rectum or mouth. The average incubation period for an initial herpes infection is 4 days, range, 2 to 12, after exposure. The vesicles break and leave painful ulcers that may take two to four weeks to heal after the initial herpes infection. Experiencing these symptoms is referred to as having a first herpes outbreak or episode. Clinical manifestations of genital herpes differ between the first and recurrent i.e., subsequent outbreaks. The first outbreak of herpes is often associated with a longer duration of herpetic lesions, increased viral shedding, making HSV transmission more likely, and systemic symptoms including fever, body aches, swollen lymph nodes, or headache. Recurrent outbreaks of genital herpes are common, and many patients who recognize recurrences have prodromal symptoms, either localized genital pain, or tingling or shooting pains in the legs, hips or buttocks, which occur hours to days before the eruption of herpetic lesions. Symptoms of recurrent outbreaks are typically shorter in duration and less severe than the first outbreak of genital herpes. Long-term studies have indicated that the number of symptomatic recurrent outbreaks may decrease over time. Recurrences and subclinical shedding are much less frequent for genital HSV-1 infection than for genital HSV-2 infection. What are the complications of genital herpes? 
Genital herpes may cause painful genital ulcers that can be severe and persistent in persons with suppressed immune systems, such as HIV-infected persons. Both HSV-1 and HSV-2 can also cause rare but serious complications such as aseptic meningitis inflammation of the linings of the brain. Development of extragenital lesions e.g. buttocks, groin, thigh, finger, or eye may occur during the course of infection. Some persons who contract genital herpes have concerns about how it will impact their overall health, sex life, and relationships. There can also be considerable embarrassment, shame, and stigma associated with a herpes diagnosis that can substantially interfere with a patient's relationships. Clinicians can address these concerns by encouraging patients to recognize that while herpes is not curable, it is a manageable condition. Three important steps that providers can take for their newly diagnosed patients are giving information, providing support resources, and helping define treatment and prevention options. Patients can be counseled that risk of genital herpes transmission can be reduced, but not eliminated, by disclosure of infection to sexual partners, avoiding sex during a recurrent outbreak, use of suppressive antiviral therapy, and consistent condom use. Since a diagnosis of genital herpes may affect perceptions about existing or future sexual relationships, it is important for patients to understand how to talk to sexual partners about STDs. There are also potential complications for a pregnant woman and her newborn child. How does herpes infection affect a pregnant woman and her baby? HIV, AIDS and STDs. HIV, AIDS and STDs. What is the link between genital herpes and HIV? Genital ulcerative disease caused by herpes makes it easier to transmit and acquire HIV infection sexually. There is an estimated two to four-fold increased risk of acquiring HIV, if individuals with genital herpes infection are genitally exposed to HIV. Ulcers or breaks in the skin or mucous membranes, lining of the mouth, vagina, and rectum, from a herpes infection may compromise the protection normally provided by the skin and mucous membranes against infections, including HIV. In addition, having genital herpes increases the number of CD4 cells, the target cell for HIV entry, in the genital mucosa. In persons with both HIV and genital herpes, local activation of HIV replication at the site of genital herpes infection can increase the risk that HIV will be transmitted during contact with the mouth, vagina, or rectum of an HIV uninfected sex partner. How does genital herpes affect a pregnant woman and her baby? Neonatal herpes is one of the most serious complications of genital herpes. Healthcare providers should ask all pregnant women if they have a history of genital herpes. Herpes infection can be passed from mother to child during pregnancy or childbirth, or babies may be infected shortly after birth, resulting in a potentially fatal neonatal herpes infection. Infants born to women who acquire genital herpes close to the time of delivery and are shedding virus at delivery are at a much higher risk for developing neonatal herpes, compared with women who have recurrent genital herpes. Thus, it is important that women avoid contracting herpes during pregnancy. Women should be counseled to abstain from intercourse during the third trimester with partners known to have or suspected of having genital herpes. While women with genital herpes may be offered antiviral medication late in pregnancy through delivery to reduce the risk of a recurrent herpes outbreak, third trimester antiviral prophylaxis has not been shown to decrease the risk of herpes transmission to the neonate. Routine serologic HSV screening of pregnant women is not recommended. However, at onset of labor, all women should undergo careful examination and questioning to evaluate for presence of prodromal symptoms or herpetic lesions. If herpes symptoms are present a cesarean delivery is recommended to prevent HSV transmission to the infant. There are detailed guidelines for how to manage asymptomatic infants born to women with active genital herpes lesions. How is genital herpes diagnosed? The preferred HSV tests for patients with active genital ulcers are detection of HSV DNA by nucleic acid amplification tests such as polymerase chain reaction PCR, or isolation by viral culture. HSV culture requires collection of a sample from the lesion and, once viral growth is seen, specific cell staining to differentiate between HSV1 and HSV2. However, culture sensitivity is low, especially for recurrent lesions, and declines as lesions heal. 
PCR is more sensitive, allows for more rapid and accurate results, and is increasingly being used. Because viral shedding is intermittent, failure to detect HSV by culture or PCR does not indicate an absence of HSV infection. Sank preparations are insensitive and nonspecific and should not be used. Herpes serologic tests are blood tests that detect antibodies to the herpes virus. Providers should only request type-specific glycoprotein G GG, based serologic assays when serology is performed for their patients. Several ELISA-based serologic tests are FDA-approved and available commercially. While the presence of HSV2 antibody can be presumed to reflect genital infection, patients should be counseled that the presence of HSV1 antibody may represent either oral or genital infection. The sensitivities of glycoprotein G type specific serologic tests for HSV2 vary from 80 to 98%. False negative results might be more frequent at early stages of infection. The most commonly used test, Herpes Select HSV2 ELISA, might be falsely positive at low index values. Such low values should be confirmed with another test such as BioKit or the Western Blot. Negative HSV1 results should be interpreted with caution because some ELISA-based serologic tests are insensitive for detection of HSV1 antibody. IgM testing for HSV1 or HSV2 is not useful, because IgM tests are not type-specific and might be positive during recurrent genital or oral episodes of herpes. For the symptomatic patient, testing with both virologic and serologic assays can determine whether it is a new infection or a newly recognized old infection. A primary infection would be supported by a positive virologic test and a negative serologic test, while the diagnosis of recurrent disease would be supported by positive virologic and serologic test results. CDC does not recommend screening for HSV1 or HSV2 in the general population. Several scenarios where type-specific serologic HSV tests may be useful include Patients with recurrent genital symptoms or atypical symptoms and negative HSV PCR or culture Patients with a clinical diagnosis of genital herpes but no laboratory confirmation Patients who report having a partner with genital herpes Patients presenting for an STD evaluation, especially those with multiple sex partners Persons with HIV infection, and MSM at increased risk for HIV acquisition. Please note that while type-specific herpes testing can determine if a person is infected with HSV1 or HSV2, or both, there is no commercially available test to determine if a herpes infection in one individual was acquired from another specific person. CDC encourages patients to discuss any herpes questions and concerns with their health care provider or seek counsel at an STD clinic.